So what I'm going to have you guys do here in just a second is to actually go through and solve these three. Right? With all single replacement reactions, it's my recommendation that you always predict your problems. Every single time. So spend the time, draw out what those products are, balance them out as best you can. If you have questions about balancing them, can you raise your hand and I'll come ask. Okay. Once you've predicted what would happen, then you should decide, does it happen? Okay. So there's two questions that go with a single replacement. What would products be if it happened? And then the next question is, does it happen? The does it happen requires using the activity series. The what would happen if it did happen is just balancing out charges and following the pattern of a single replacement reaction. So there's three reactions shown there. Go through and work through them to the best of your ability. I'll give you three or four minutes to work through it. If you've got questions, raise your hand, talk to people around you, talk to me, that kind of fun stuff. So if we look, let's ignore the top one for the moment. If we do the single replacement, we get magnesium with nitrate, and then we get nickel by itself, right? Okay. All we're showing is the basics. We've done the double replacement. Okay. Why did I not write a 2 right after the nitrate? Because that's that would be balanced I didn't write a 2 there because I haven't finished my work. Just because there's a 2 in the reactant side does not mean there needs to be a 2 there. Okay. Why is the 2 in nickel nitrate? What is the meaning of this red 2? Why are there two nitrates? To neutralize nickel. That's why there's a two. It's directly tied to information about the nickel. In the product, is nitrate with nickel anymore? No. No. So the two doesn't show up because the only reason I have that red two is to balance nickel. Since it's not with nickel, I don't place it. Okay. Which brings up the next question. Is that the correct formula? No. Magnesium has what charge? A plus two. Nitrate has a minus one. So that formula is not balanced. How do we fix that formula? I need a parenthesis two. And this is usually where people go, isn't the purple two the same as the red two? Well, the first thing I'll say is no, because one's purple, one's red. Okay. Why am I color coding them as different things? They're there for different reasons. The purple two is there to balance magnesium. The red two is to balance nickel. Okay. So we have to be careful with the meaning of our subscripts, because we will place potentially even identical numbers in the identical spot, but they mean different things. Okay? So then the next question that sometimes gets asked, why was I allowed to move the blue three? What's that? That three is as much a part of the identity of nitrate as the I is part of nickel. Can I just delete the I when I look at the form or the symbol for nickel? No. Why not? What happens? I change the identity of that element to now nitrogen instead of nickel. Okay. Why does that become an extra confusing thing to worry about? Well, I have numbers as subscripts. Those numbers as a subscript can mean the identity of the compound. It can also mean the number of that thing that's there. They're being placed in the exact same location, but they have different meanings. So you have to be careful when you deal with those numbers to make sure you're tracking what the meaning follows from. Kind of make sense? All right. The next example I would use from that is if we look above to the previous equation with sodium metal and nickel nitrate. If we went through and ran this one, we'd get sodium with nitrate, right? <coughs> Is that formula balanced? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't bring the two across. Why not? I don't need it to balance that formula. Right. 
So I've predicted the proper products. Now my equation is ready to balance. So I have a balancing of products. Once the products are balanced, then I can balance the equation. And for the first one, is the equation actually balanced? No, because I've got two nitrates on one side and one nitrate on the other. So I could fix that by putting a 2 as a coefficient for the sodium and that sodium nitrate. Make sense? So we have lots of balancing stages. One of those stages is balancing out your formulas, kind of like what you do in nomenclature. Right? So again, in nomenclature, I don't care that you get to the name, but I do care about the process. Why is the process important? That's how we predict proper products. Right? This is why I don't like the crossover method, because all the crossover method is doing is helping you to get to a name. It's removing the content of understanding why you're doing it. When we go through and do it here, that, we don't need to name it, but we do need to understand why those things balance out. Make sense? So we have to balance our products, then we have to balance the equation. What happens if we try to balance the equation before we balance our products? Then you're done a bunch of useless work. If we're lucky, we're actually doing a bunch of useless work that we recognize, because when we try to go through and balance the equation, it goes in a never-ending loop. Okay? And as you go through and change one number, it continually cycles and changes the other numbers, and you can never balance it. Okay? If you end up in kind of an endless loop when you're balancing reactions, it's probably because you didn't balance your products. If you're unlucky, what happens? You get an answer, it actually balances out. Okay? So one of those cases would be potentially doing something like that, okay, with that first example. Okay? If I did that, I would be able to balance the equation as such. Unfortunately, that answer is wrong because sodium nitrate doesn't need two nitrates. Okay? So we have to be careful behind the meaning behind each of these things. If we're lucky, it fails for us and shows us the failure so that we can fix it. If we're unlucky, that failure becomes hidden and we don't actually recognize it until it's way too late. Kind of make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'm going to erase that top equation. Whoops. Look at the one that we've got. So we've predicted, just like if I want a million dollars, I know what I'm going to buy. Okay, I know what I'm going to do with it. That does not mean I'm now going to go buy okay, or save or do any of those things because I haven't won the million dollars yet, but I still have that plan. Okay, so here's my plan. Now we have to answer the question, did it actually happen? To answer that question, we have to go back to the activity series and identify the important things within it. Those important things would be our metals. We're looking at magnesium and I was about to say nitrogen, nickel, and I already forgot what I was looking at, magnesium, and our nickel. Okay. Again, to the interpretation of our activity series. The higher on the activity series, the more, it wants to be a the more it wants to be a compound. So I take a look at magnesium being higher on the series, it wants to be a compound. In my reaction equation, where is magnesium a compound? only on the right-hand side of the equation. On the left-hand side, it's all by itself. Okay? I could also look at nickel and say nickel is lower on the activity series, which means it wants to be alone. Where is nickel by itself? On the right-hand side of the equation. Okay? When I run a reaction, what things do I mix? Any reaction. What things do I mix? It's a really easy question, and, and you guys are probably overthinking. Elements is too difficult. No. Nope. Reactants. I mix reactants. They're on the left-hand side of my arrow. Okay. What happens if a reaction occurs? What happens to those reactants? They become products. When I look at this equation, the stars are saying, I want to become products. When I mix those reactants, what happens? I get those products. Kind of, sort of? Okay. 
So let's try the next one. What do I get for the next one? I got silver with chloride. Why am I not bringing the three across? Is the three what makes that chloride? No. Why is the three there? The three is only there to balance the aluminum. Since there's no more aluminum, I'm not bringing the three across. I may still need the three, just like in the previous one. I still needed the two, but it's a different meaning. Okay. So when we first go through to predict, blanket first, go simple as possible, then you can advance. Silver chloride, and then what's the other one? Aluminum. Aluminum. Did I predict my products correctly? To figure that out, what do I have to do? Look at the charges. Okay. Silver is a plus one, chloride is a minus one. Is that a correct product? Yes. yes. Now that I've got a correct product, I can go through and balance the equation, which I'm going to stop showing work for all those, right? Do I do it? Yeah. So there's my balanced equation. So now the question is, does this one happen? Uh, there was a face. Is it not balanced? No, I just forgot that you have to balance it. Okay. So yeah, every time you should go through and balance your equations. Okay. So should this reaction occur? To answer that question, what do we do? We look at our activity series, and in particular, the metals that we're referencing, silver and aluminum. There's aluminum, there's silver. Which one do you want to look at first? Aluminum. Where's aluminum on the activity series? Higher in the activity series, which means it wants to be a compound. Where's aluminum a compound? On the left-hand side of the equation. We can also go through and look at silver. Where is silver on our activity series? The bottom, what does it want to be? Alone. Where is silver alone? On the left-hand side of the equation. When I mix my reactants, silver and aluminum chloride, what happens? They don't react. Okay. For them to react, silver would have to become a compound. Silver doesn't want to become a compound, so it just chills on its own and just sits there in the solution. Kind of make sense? Questions about that? <coughs> Do you still write everything down and balance it if you know that it's not going to have a reaction? Do you have to balance it if you know it's not a reaction? No. Depends on the question. If I ask the question, does this reaction happen, you don't need to balance it. Okay? If I ask, balance, predict the products and balance this equation, yeah, you got to go through and do it. Because in that statement, I'm not asking, does the reaction happen or not? I'm just saying, you need to do it. <coughs> Say it happens, balance the equation, answer that question. So it depends on the question asked. Ness, you had a question too? Yeah, that Okay. Are you going to include the activities? Uh, well, it's going to show up here in just a second, but in the upper left-hand corner, what we'll see is a little sign that says, I provide an activity series. Okay. I don't want to click next yet because that's going to delete all my work. All right. Do we have questions about the work that's up there? Okay. So we guys get everybody gets it? Cool. Uh, I'm not going to do the last one. We did really briefly talk about the concept of gold. Gold and platinum are, tend to be our most valuable metals. Why do they tend to be the most valuable? They don't change, which means as a currency, <coughs> they're phenomenal. Because now if I take that gold and throw water at it, what happens to it? It stays gold. It may get wet, but it's still gold. It hasn't changed. Okay? Think about our currency. If we threw something at it and it changed, that could be potentially problematic. Okay? Like you go up to buy something and say, here's 20 bucks. I'm, and they're like, poof, that's only $5. You owe me more money. Okay? That would be kind of crappy. Okay? So we want a system where it stays static. Okay? We also now live in a society where we don't try and intentionally cheat each other that badly and pull like magic tricks of stealing money. Okay? But in older days, that's why we had gold. Okay? Kind of makes sense? 
Uh, and of course, I deleted all that work. That's helpful. Good job, Mike. There's the little sign that says, I will give you a condensed activity series. Uh, I want to address one more point here. So let's take a look at our magnesium nitrate plus our nickel. Because this gets us into the next section, which, yes, causes lots of confusion. Okay? Particularly for anybody that decided to not listen to me and do crossover methods or other weird things okay? um, when it came to balancing things. <clears throat> what is the charge on nitrate? So minus one, right? Both sides of the equation. Yeah? What is the charge on this nickel, purple nickel? Okay, it's plus two. How do you know that? Okay, there's two nitrates, and I was told to memorize that nitrate is a minus one, so it has to be a plus two. How else do you know that nickel is a... Sorry, never mind. I lied. Ignore that statement. Yeah. Let's move to magnesium. What is the charge on magnesium, the green magnesium? It's a plus two. How do you know it's a plus two? You're supposed to memorize that and or... There's two nitrates. There was another option of saying, I didn't memorize it, but I remembered that Mike said that they were trying to become the noble gases. The closest noble gas is neon, so magnesium will lose two electrons, which makes it plus two. No, no, no. Okay. Okay. Either is fine. It doesn't matter. Okay. Which now might beg the question, what is the charge on this magnesium? Where is charge written? It is always written in the top right corner. Why do we not see charge written for nickel nitrate? Because nickel nitrate has a zero charge written in the upper right hand corner. If I look at the individual pieces, I can label the charge on those pieces contributing to the overall charge. How many pieces are in that magnesium solid? One. What is its overall charge? Zero. zero. It is not plus two, because if it was plus two, what would have to be written there? Plus two. Plus two. What is the charge on the nickel in our product side? Zero. It is also a zero. Okay? So the charge is always given to you. So... This is kind of an interesting thing that's happening with our single replacement reactions. Okay? The single replacement reactions aren't just the moving of those pieces, but we're also changing the charge, quote unquote, of those metals. Okay? Well, what dictates charge? The number of electrons. So if I take a look at the magnesium, what happened to it? I went from a zero to... A plus two. So what changed? Okay. It lost two electrons. Uh, I don't want to use the word gave because gave sounds an awful lot like gained, which is what nickel is doing. Okay. Well, our electrons matter. Yes. Can I create or destroy matter? No, which means in these equations, when magnesium lost its electrons, it didn't just lose them, something had to take them at the exact same time. Where in that equation do you see electrons explicitly stated? Nowhere. They don't show up in an equation. Why would electrons not show up in a balanced equation? Are electrons stable? No, they're insanely unstable, which means I can't use them as a reactant or a product because they're so unstable, they don't exist on their own. Right. This adds a whole new layer of whatever you want to call it on top of these type of reactions, particularly our single replacement. We have to be cognizant of the electrons being transferred. Right. And those are much more difficult to tra or track because we don't explicitly write them out. We have to be able to use the equation and pull what we know about quote-unquote charge 
to determine how many electrons were transferred back and forth. When we looked at the magnesium, we said it lost two electrons. What happened to the nickel? It went from a plus two to a zero. How does it go from a plus two to a zero? It had to gain exactly two electrons. Is my equation balanced? Yeah. So not only do I have to go through and balance each of the elements across my equation, I also have to make sure that I've balanced all of the electrons. Okay? Because the electrons aren't explicitly stated, this becomes a much more challenging question to deal with, which is why it shows up in a much later section in our textbook, Chapter 17. Okay? This section of material is important to be discussed and be aware of. The level of detail that you need to know behind it becomes very, very questionable, okay? particularly with how the textbook presents balancing redox or uh, electron transfer reactions. Okay? So there may have been a mistake because at least one person went through and read the section on balancing oxidation state reactions. Don't read reactions. The textbook's description of balancing chemical reactions that involve electrons is very, very difficult. Ignore it. Okay? And those of you saying, well, how bad is it? I have a hard time understanding what they're trying to do. Okay? There are easier methods. Sometimes we have to use them. Sometimes we don't. Did we have to look at the electrons to balance this equation? No, we didn't. So sometimes the elements will help us balance the equation, and we don't have to worry about looking at the electrons. Sometimes they don't. Okay? So we have to be a little bit more careful whenever we think electrons are being transferred around. Okay? <coughs> What's a giant red flag that we think electrons are being transferred around? Change in the charge. Change in the charge. Is the charge something that's easy for everybody to determine? Some people might be okay with it. Going from by itself to being bonded. If we're by itself, what is its charge? Zero. Zero. Is it not by itself over here? Zero. Yeah, which means? It's charged. It's charged. It's charge changed. If it's charge changes, all electrons were transferred. Right? So a big red flag for this type of equation or reaction is if you have an element all by itself with zero charge. Because if it did anything, its charge has to change. Okay? If its charge changes, it's one of these tricky questions that we have to deal with. Okay? Kind of, sort of? Okay. Your textbook goes through and looks at another example of uh, read up, or single replacement reactions. There are some metals that are so reactive that they will react with water. Okay? Uh, and we can even switch this up. There are some metals that would react with acids, which this will actually work fine. We'll just do this. Okay. Both of these are examples of single replacement reactions. Okay. But they don't quite fit the pattern that we've discussed. All right, let's look at the bottom one first, because I think that one's a little bit easier. Why does that one not fit the pattern of single replacement reactions we've been talking about? Because it's not switching to metals. We aren't switching to metals. We don't have to switch to metals right, when we run a single replacement reaction. Right? And if we go back and look at the summary slide, which I don't remember where it is, but it's too far back for me to backtrack to it, it does not specifically say two metals. Okay? It says cationic species. Okay? Or it says cations. So it's really just referencing things that would be positively charged. Which is great for metals because what charges are metals? They're always positive. That's why single replacements stand out with metals. When we go through and take a look at HCl, there isn't a metal there. However, what happens with that compound? The hydrogen has what charge? A positive one. Okay. Is the hydrogen a cationic species? Yes. So I can do the single replacement reaction here. 
I'm exchanging the positive things that like to be positive, I'm exchanging with each other. So I'm exchanging the calcium and hydrogen in this equation. So I get the calcium with the chlorine, and I get hydrogen all by itself. Why is it written as H2 and not just H? Hydrogen is a diatomic element, so when hydrogen goes all by itself, it has to be H2. Okay? The flip on this, we go up one tier, one reaction above this, and we say, well, this also happens with some metals and water. Well, what's the cationic species in water? This is where an alternate format for writing water can come in handy. What's the cationic species? It's the hydrogen. So what am I exchanging? Hydrogen for sodium, and I get sodium bonded to my hydroxide, and then I get the hydrogen all by itself again. Okay. All they're trying to show is that this can happen, and it does happen. What causes this to happen? What says these are valid reactions? The activity series. The activity series. So when you look at the activity series, and this one we can step back for. Take a look through. Okay. Tell me when I'm not out of metal. Oh, hydrogen. Why is hydrogen in this column? What can hydrogen act as? A cation, which is typically what we would represent for metals. Right? Does our periodic table tell us that? Kind of. How? Hydrogen is on the left-hand side of the table. Right? That information is already kind of embedded in the periodic table. Hi. So you may see reference to hydrogen popping up. You'll see it for sure in the lab. I tend to not test on that and just deal with the metals, but just be aware of it. Which gets us into chapter 17, our oxidation and reduction, which was the video you all watched last weekend, right? Okay. And in that, what you are looking at is looking at the transfer of electrons from one unit to another. Okay. And this is where we come up with the concept of oxidation state or oxidation number. Ultimately, what those things are, or oxidation state and oxidation number, those are charges. Well, <laughs> does that help? Yeah. Why would we use two words to define the same thing? <laughs> Oxidation state and charge. Both look at the balance of electrons versus protons. Why do I have two terms meaning the same thing? Oh, what the guy on the bottom was saying. Okay. They're similar, but they're different. How is oxidation state different than charge? <coughs> oxidation state looks at the charge of each individual component, while the charge looks at the singular unit. Okay. The oxidation state looks at each individual component. I would argue we can get stricter on our component word. Atom. An oxidation state is specific to an atom. Okay. Charge is whatever we're looking at. If I'm looking at an atom, then the oxidation state and the charge are the same thing. But if I'm looking at a molecule, the charge and the oxidation state will now be different because the charge looks at the entire unit. The oxidation state only looks at the individual pieces within that, okay, or the individual atoms within that. Okay, this is exceedingly confusing because of that overlap. The example that we could give, and I always get it backwards, so I'll probably screw it up. Oh, no, I think I got it. A square is a rectangle, but a rectangle is not a square. Okay? It's the same kind of idea here. Okay. We get one kind of sweeping, broad regulation that we have four sides. That's a rectangle. Well, a square has four sides. Why is a square different than a rectangle? All sides are the same. 
The same thing's happening roughly with charge and oxidation state. Oxidation state applies to an individual atom, okay, or one type of atom, okay, and the charge applies to whatever the larger unit was. Okay. So you should have seen this summary. We've got these rules. You need to know your ionic charges from your ionic compounds. Okay. That becomes important when you're looking at an ionic compound. Okay. For instance, I could have you go through and determine the oxidation states for everything within calcium hydroxide. Okay. And the reason we're allowed to do that is because that compound is ionic, bless you, and I've got calcium, which is a plus two charge, and I have hydroxide, which is a negative one charge. Right out of the gate, I now know calcium is a plus two oxidation state, because when I split this, what I'm looking at is, sorry, pen, this unit now. That unit has how many elements? One, which means the oxidation state and the charge are the same thing. When I go through and look at the other half of this, I have OH with a minus. The charge on that will be minus 1. The oxidation state I will have to solve for with a little bit more math than I had to do for calcium. Why do I have to do more math? There's more elements within it. Okay? There's more than just one. Okay? The next step is we need to have some rules to help us calculate this. Your oxidation or your oxygen will always have a minus two oxidation state. Okay? There is an exception to that. We won't worry about it. Okay? Why would we always say oxygen is a minus two? If it's a minus two, what is it doing to the electrons? It's gaining them. It's always ripping electrons away from whatever it's bonded to. Why would oxygen always rip electrons from whatever it was bonded to? Oxygen is the second most electronegative element on the periodic table, meaning when I put it near anything, what is it going to do to the electrons from the other element? It's going to take them away, putting the minus two. What's the exception? When I bond oxygen to fluorine. Why is that now an exception? Fluorine's more. Fluorine's more electronegative. So fluorine would take the electrons from the oxygen. Okay? There is technically one other exception. Nitrogen's lower in electronegativity. That wouldn't work. Hydrogen's even lower. What could oxygen bond to where it can't just rip the electrons away? Itself. If we bond oxygen to another oxygen, they have equal electronegativities. Okay? Which means one can't rip both the electrons away from the other. Okay? They would have to rip evenly. Well, if they rip evenly, their oxidation state comes down to negative one-ish, okay? So it gets a little bit tricky there, okay? Notice I don't have the exceptions up there because I don't, I, I don't want you to memorize those, okay? We just did a thought experiment, that's it, okay? The next big rule is the sum of your oxidation numbers. So any <laughs> formula you're given, if you add up the oxidation number for every single element and atom that is present, when we add them all up, that must equal the overall charge. Okay. One of the things that's nice is the oxidation state is something you always have to solve for. The charge, you never solve for. Why not? It's always given to you. Where? In the upper right-hand right corner. Okay. And for those of you being smart, I'll even be, well, but when I look at nitrate, I didn't know it was a minus one. You should have known it's a minus one because nitrate isn't NO3. Nitrate is NO3 negative. Is the charge written in the upper right hand corner? Yes. It's supposed to be specified. Okay? So that formula should look really, really familiar. The number of the element times the oxidation state plus the number of the element times the oxidation state so on and so forth, equals our overall charge. That looks an awful lot like the formula I told you to use to balance out charges in a compound back in nomenclature. 
And I said it's an important formula to deal with because really the formula I gave you in nomenclature was wrong. It's not charges we're balancing out. It's oxidation states. Okay? So if we went through and looked at examples, you could tell me the charge for everything in the top part, right? So we start with zero, plus two, minus one, minus two. What is the oxidation state for the bottom? First one, zero, plus two, What is written in the upper right hand corner? <coughs> minus one. What is that? Don't tell me minus one. It's less than zero. That's the charge. If I ask for the oxidation state, yes, I was being misleading to kind of sucker you into this. Can I define the oxidation state for nitrate? No. Can I define the oxidation state for nitrogen in nitrate? Yes. Okay. Why could we define the oxidation state for the first two? Because they're, they're alone. They were a single element. The oxidation state ended up equaling the charge. It was a trivial solve. Okay. But officially, you did solve it. So let's look at that real quickly. Our formula, right? Up here, the number of the element. How many elements show up in that formula? One. Times the oxidation state. Ah, I always got to solve for this. Equals... The overall charge, the overall charge there is zero. What is the oxidation state? Zero. Okay. Why does it become more challenging when we move to the next one? Okay. How many nitrogens do I have? One times its oxidation state. Ah, i got to solve for it. Plus three times... Okay. Negative two, I'm going to argue that we shouldn't jump to negative two. You guys are doing awesome, so we'll kind of work with that. But for the sake of a recording, we'll say why, because we have to solve for it. This then equals a negative one, because it's the overall charge. Okay? I wouldn't be able to solve that, except I know that y equals, y equals negative two. Okay? Once I know that information, now I can plug in x minus 6. Sorry. that. What was y? Don't tell me negative 2. That was the oxidation state for oxygen. What is the oxidation state for oxygen? Negative 2. It's one of the things that you have to memorize. It's okay. We've got a lot of stuff flying at you. Now I've got to rewrite all that, but that's okay. 1x <laughs> plus 3y equals negative 1. y was our oxidation state for oxygen, which is a negative 2. x minus 6 equals negative 1. x equals positive 5. What did I say x was? Do not tell me positive 5. Oxidation state for nitrogen. The oxidation state for nitrogen. nitrogen. What is the charge on nitrogen? Oh. That was a nasty trick question, wasn't it? Okay. What is our ionic charge that we're told to memorize for nitrogen? Negative three. Negative three. When am I allowed to say nitrogen is a negative three? When it's, not like when it's in an ionic compound with a metal. Okay. Is it with a metal in nitrate? No. no. That's why it's not the ionic charge that you're told to memorize. Okay. Because it's changing your frame of reference. <coughs> okay? Kind of, sort of? You want to do sulfur? Yeah? Go ahead. So those of you that are good at math, keep your mouth shut and let everybody else work. Solve for the oxidation state of sulfur and sulfate. Do we need to walk through the math or you guys got it? We're good. Okay, right. this is why you have to remember that formula. That's the whole point of that formula. I do apologize that charge got shifted down. That's kind of irritating. Or at least that bothers me. Okay. That's how you're going through and doing this. You're looking at the balance of protons and electrons within an individual atom, and you're comparing that out to the charge for the molecule. Kind of make sense? Okay. 
How does this apply? When are we done? Okay, sorry. I, yeah, sorry. Okay, so unfortunately, I stepwise through all that work. Okay. Ah! Come back. Ooh, who's at the door? <laughs> it sort of works. <clears throat> so, what do we do with our oxidation state information? <laughs> what we would go through and do is assign the oxidation state for every single element on both sides of the equation. And we have to go through and do it on both sides of the equation because if the reaction changed oxidation states, we have a new set of rules to follow. So I'd have to go through and determine the oxidation state for iodine as a reactant, for iodine as a product, for oxygen as a reactant, oxygen as a product, carbon as a reactant, carbon as a product. Do you guys want to practice? Yeah. Yeah? Well, Do it. Oh, wait. You're not going to help me. <laughs> oh, you got it. Figure it out. Okay, oxidation state for all of the elements on both sides of the equation. So, first off, okay, I have to reiterate this because we went over it fast and people keep not remembering it. When we deal with oxidation states, oh, Jiminy Christmas. <laughs> These rules, you have to know. Period. Okay, and let's actually delete some stuff here, clean that up. If you do not know these rules, you cannot do this. Period. Full stop. You're done. You can't answer any questions. Okay? And for those who say, well, God, I have to memorize rules. What is FE? Iron. Iron. You already memorized rules. Memorize some more. Okay? It's the language of how we process this. Okay? The mathematical symbols are the things that we put together. The most important part on this is this rule three. Okay? And in English, it looks nasty. The sum of the oxidation numbers equals the charge on the unit. Okay. Well, this is the number of our element. So how many times did that element show up in that unit? Times its oxidation state. Remember, oxidation state is something you have to solve for. Plus the number of the next element times its oxidation state. If you got 20 elements, how many little additive things are you going to be doing? 20. You've got to do every single one. Okay. You won't. You won't have that. When you add all of those things up, that's now looking at, because each of those is saying, well, what is the balance of protons and electrons on an element? Well, if I now look at the balance of protons and electrons on all of it, <coughs> I'm now looking at the overall charge. That would be looking at, say, what is our cumulative debt in this room? Okay. Well, I know how much I'm in the hole. Well, how much are you in the hole? Okay, everybody's going to be different. We could add it all up and see that we owe millions of dollars. Phenomenal. Isn't education great? Okay. Hopefully it's not that bad because you're at the community college. <laughs> okay. well, we make you pay less. Okay. That's what's happening here. We're looking at the balance of effectively debt, the balance of electrons versus protons for each individual element. When I look at all of those together, if they're all as a tight-knit unit, a molecule, I'm now looking at the overall charge. Okay? So when we get to now our question back over here, or even this, we're now just saying, oh, what's the oxidation state? What's the oxidation state? You go, oh, it's not that bad. It's not that bad. That's, that's like the first step. And that step, when we got down to it, and I'm going to call out people for the bottom one, okay? where we got out to nitrogen, and I said, what's the oxidation state of nitrogen? And someone was like, plus five. Barely got the words out of my mouth, and someone's already shouting out the answer. Okay? They've done the math. How fast do you have to do the math of that oxidation state stuff? Just about the same speed that them calling out five after I finished making the statement. That's how fast you have to do it. Why? Because that's not the question. The question becomes, when we get out over to here, and something along these lines, oh, that door keeps doing stuff. That's why when we get here, you can tell me the oxidation state for each of these elements, and you can look at it quickly, and you can be like, 
iodine, well, that one's really hard. Actually, I would, I would argue you can't do that. I can't do that one that fast. Okay? You would go through and do the work and say for iodine, there's two iodines times its oxidation state. I don't know what it is. Plus five, yep, five oxygens. I know the oxidation state is minus two. Okay? Because I'm going to stop doing that Y thing for it because Mike told me to memorize it. And I'm trying to go faster. This equals the overall charge. Now, where's the overall charge? It is always in the upper right-hand corner. There is no exception. It is always in the upper right-hand corner. There's nothing specified at zero. Okay? Some people are good at looking at that and just saying, well, it comes out to five. Well, good for you. <laughs> 2x minus 10 equals zero. Now I can do that part. Okay? But not everybody can. 2x equals 10. x equals 10 over 2, which equals 5. That now reveals the plus 5. I still have three more to go through and solve. Some of those are easier than others. For instance, the iodine in the product. What other elements is iodine with? None. None. What is the oxidation state for iodine there? Zero. Okay? And I can solve for it a little bit quicker. Okay? With practice, and it requires practice. This is why we did nomenclature. And I said, this is how you should do it because I'm trying to set you up for this. Okay, so you could get that process so you'd be fast here. You... <laughs> so that you would get, oh, whatever. <laughs> you would get to this, because now we can ask the question. But before we ask the question, what's your question? Um, can you, is iodine zero just because it's by itself? So... so there's a couple ways we could go through and do this. We could go through and memorize that elements by themselves are always zero, or we trust that Mike's method was valid. First one. Depending on how much you've got to memorize, yeah. Okay, how many elements are in I2? Two. There's two elements times its oxidation state. What is the oxidation state? I always got to solve for it. X equals the overall charge. Zero. What is X? So yes, I can memorize it, but if we follow the method, the method didn't fail. That's a good method. <laughs> okay? That's why it's there. So the question that now comes up, that's what you're getting asked when we get to this material, is not what is the oxidation state, but what happened. So what happened to iodine in the course of this reaction? We went from a plus 5 to a zero. What did it have to do? Okay. So we get all sorts of fun things. What happened to the oxidation state? <coughs> Plus five to zero. It went down, right? So we might say, well, it lost. But I hear a lot of people saying gain. Awesome. What did it gain? Electrons. electrons. It goes down because electrons are Negative. negatively charged. Remember that minus sign? Son of a gun. It's still going to haunt you. Okay. So if we go through and look at that, it gained electrons. Well, what happened to the oxygen? It didn't Nothing, so I don't care. Well, it's not that I don't care. Oxygen's a nice thing. Okay? No change. What happened to carbon? It lost electrons. So I could now permanently go through life referencing iodine as saying it gained electrons or carbon that it lost electrons. And I could go through and apply this for every single reaction and say this thing gained electrons, this thing lost electrons. That's two words. God, I'm lazy. I don't want to say two words every time this happens. I want to invent a new word that means gained of electrons. Or a new word that means loss of electrons. Okay. This is where we encounter the terms oxidation and reduction. Okay. Let's take a look at the carbon. Yes, it lost electrons. When I think about lost electrons, I can see that if I rearrange those letters, it spells oxidation. Huh? I don't see an X. Okay, good. It doesn't do that. Okay, that didn't work at all. So why are we calling it oxidation? Oil. Why are we calling it oxidation? We'll get to oil rig. I'll yell about that too. Oil rig. It's uh, Leo Gerr. Look at what happened to carbon in the course of this reaction. Carbon on the reactant side is bound to 
Oxygen. What were we talking about? Oxidation. Oxi oxygen. Oxidate. Interesting. What happened to the oxygen in the course of the reaction? Bound to one oxygen, bound to two oxygens. What did I do to the amount of oxygens? I increased them. If I increase the amount of oxygens, I've done an oxidation. Why is that where the name came from and not looking at electrons? When did we discover reduction in oxidation? Long before we knew electrons. If we don't know about electrons, we have to come up with an alternate means to name these things. Okay? So oxidation was loss of electrons. What about the gain of electrons? Okay. Well, what happened to the iodine? We were bound to five oxygens, and now no oxygens. What did I do to the amount of oxygens? I reduced them. Our redox reactions were centered off of oxygen. Why oxygen? That's how we live. Oxygen is an important molecule. It's super reactive, and that's why we actually exist. It's because of our ability to react and oxidize. Right? Oxygen is such an important molecule that we tracked how it interacted with a bunch of different things. Because it's now the thing that's doing all those reactions, we named our reaction sequence after oxygen. Okay? We now need to go beyond that because not all reactions involve increasing and decreasing oxygens. Some do other things, but they still gain and lose electrons. Okay? So we now have to tie oxidation as a term not to oxygen, but to the loss of electrons. And I have to tie the word reduction no longer to less oxygens, but now to gaining electrons. And I have to remember that parallel. Okay? Just like for our diatomics, we came up with a mnemonic device. Remember, have no fear of ice cold beer. We can do something <laughs> similar with our oxidations. Okay? I can define the loss of electrons as oxidation, or the gain of electrons as reduction. Leo, also known as lion, what do lions do? Burr. There we go. And now I have it set up. Okay? And it's phenomenal. It's awesome. It's earth friendly. It's cool. Okay? Oil rigs are not. Okay? <laughs> Loss of electrons, oxidation. Everything ties beautifully. It's there. Leo says Gur. Okay? And for those of you saying, God, I hope I don't have to remember, you will still like it. what happened in this reaction? And you'll see me mutter on Leo's electrons. Loss, electron, ox it was oxidized. That's what happened. I still do it. Right? I still reference it because I don't want to bother to deal with all the other stuff. That's how it works. For whatever reason, because I consider this campus to be friendly and green, and we've got an environmental technology center like where we do green plant stuff. <laughs> Virtually everybody here, for some reason, memorizes oxidation is loss to oil rig. Oxidation is loss of what? I don't know, it's just oil. It's all, oxidation is lost. The term doesn't even tell you what you're gaining or losing. Come on. Leo says grr. So much better. Right? So much. Yeah, baby, yeah. Right? Dude, your kids got mad at me for taking oil rigs. They got really good. Awesome vibe. Come on, man. Okay? That's just, you know, just kind of for the record. So that means when we go through and look at a reaction, I want to be able to say this species was oxidized. This species was reduced. Okay. And we do have like 30 seconds for the next one to just kind of jam a screwdriver into the back of you while you're all turning away. <clears throat> we'll also go through and define something known as the agent. Okay? I will look at the oxidizing agent and the reducing agent. Okay? So, because I think I color-coded well, okay, Leo was oxidation, and that was what color? Blue. Blue. Oxidi oh, oxidizing, right? That begins with O, so that would be oxidation, and yet what color did I choose? Red. red. Why did I choose red? What is an oxidizing agent? 
an oxidizing agent was reduced. The oxidizing agent causes something else to be oxidized. If something else is oxidized, what must happen to it? It must be reduced. So the oxidizing agent and the reducing agent do the or are the opposite of what it seems like. Okay? We will look at examples later. All the examples so far were they oxidized? All the examples so far we're looking at oxygen. If we take a look at some quick ones that are up there, you'll notice that you may not be able to do it based off of oxygen. That first one doesn't work. Okay. 